In this video, we consider girders that are composed of plate elements, in particular those with non-compact or slender webs. In a previous video about the design of beams, we covered hot roll shapes and for all the standard sections in the manual, the webs are compact. Some have non-compact flanges, but none have slender flanges. With shapes built up from plates, however, both flanges and webs can be compact, non-compact, or slender. These built-up shapes usually are used when the bending moments are larger than standard hot rolled shapes can resist, usually because of a large span. These girders are invariably very deep, resulting in non-compact or slender webs. A plate girder cross-section can take several forms. The usual configuration is a single web with two equal flanges with all parts connected by welding. The box section which has two webs as well as two flanges is a torsionally superior shape and can be used when large unbraced lengths are necessary. We consider only I-shaped welded plate girders in this video but the calculations are the same. Structural steel design is largely a matter of providing for stability, either locally or in an overall sense. Many standard hot rolled structural shapes are proportioned so that local stability problems have been eliminated or minimized. When a plate girder is used, however, the designer must account for factors that in many cases would not be a problem with a hot rolled shape. Deep, Thin webs account for many of the special problems associated with plate girders, including local instability. In some cases, plate girders rely on the strength available after the web has buckled, so most of the flexural strength will come from the flanges. The limit states considered are yielding of the tension flange and buckling of the compression flange. Compression flange buckling can be caused by lateral torsional buckling or can take the form of vertical buckling into the web or flange local buckling. At a location of high shear in a girder web, usually near the support and at or near the neutral axis, the principal planes will be inclined with respect to the longitudinal axis of the member and the principal stresses will be diagonal tension and diagonal compression. The diagonal tension poses no particular problem, but the diagonal compression can cause the web to buckle. This problem can be addressed in one of three ways. First, the depth to thickness ratio of the web can be made small enough that the problem is eliminated. Second, Web stiffeners can be used to form panels with increased shear strength. These stiffeners must extend to the flanges and cutouts are made to not interfere with the welds. The stiffeners should be able to resist the shear from concentrated loads. Third are web stiffeners that are used to form panels that resist the diagonal compression through tension field action. This type of stiffeners does not extend to the flanges. Let us explain what tension field action means. At the point of impending buckling, the web loses its ability to support the diagonal compression and this stress is shifted to the transverse stiffeners and the flanges. The stiffeners resist the vertical component of the diagonal compression. The flanges resist the horizontal component the web will need to resist only the diagonal tension, hence the term tension field action. This behavior can be likened to that of a Pratt truss, in which the vertical web members carry compression and the diagonals carry tension. Other limit states resulting from the application of concentrated loads to the top flange are web yielding, where the web reaches its yield strength, web crippling, which is sometimes called web buckling, and sideway web buckling, which occurs when the compression in the web causes the tension flange to buckle laterally. 
Sideway web buckling can occur if the flanges are not adequately restrained against movement relative to one another by stiffeners. Or not restrained laterally using connections or lateral bracing. The welds for connecting the components of a plate girder are designed in much the same way as for other welded connections. The flange to web welds must resist the horizontal shear at the interface between the two components. This applied shear, called the shear flow, is usually expressed as a force per unit length of girder to be resisted by the weld, where Q is the moment about the neutral axis of the area between the horizontal shear plane and the outside face of the section. Understanding the proportions of the plate girders and their effect on the structure is vital for guaranteeing the safety and the longevity of the structure. When it comes to the web, AISC B4, table B4.1b, indicates that the web of a doubly symmetric I-shaped section is non-compact if the following condition is met, and slender if the following condition is met. It is often required for runway beams that are used to carry the overhead crane's tracks to have a wider top flange than the bottom flange. In this case, the web is non-compact when the following condition is met, and slender when the following condition is met, where H sub C is twice the distance from the elastic neutral axis to the inside face of the compression flange and HP is twice the distance from the plastic neutral axis to the inside face of the compression flange. MP is the plastic moment and MY is the elastic moment. To prevent vertical buckling of the compression flange into the web, AISC F13.2 imposes an upper limit on the web slenderness. The limiting value of H over TW is a function of the aspect ratio A over H of the girder panels, which is the ratio of intermediate stiffener spacing to web depth, and the maximum limits for both the single and double symmetric girders will be the following depending on the ratio of stiffener distance to web depth. In all girders without web stiffeners, AISC F13.2 requires that H over TW be no greater than 260 and the ratio of the web area to the compression flange area be no greater than 10. For singly symmetric sections, the proportions of the cross section must be such that IYC over IY is between 0.1 and 0.9, where IYC is the moment of inertia of the compression flange about the Y axis and IY is the moment of inertia of the entire section about the Y axis. Now that we know how to proportion the girder to avoid local stability weaknesses, why we need stiffeners, and how to know which type of stiffeners to use, in the next video we will calculate the flexural strength of the girder and how the calculations are different from the standard beams. In addition to how to calculate the shear strength of the girder and how do the stiffeners and their spacing affect it. We will also show how to choose the appropriate size and dimensions for intermediate stiffeners and their welds. Finally, we will analyze bearing stiffeners and show how to determine their dimensions. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.